Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Steve Johnston. Steve is the Chief Executive Officer for the Bundaberg Regional Council, uh, which is a uh, which is a regional council located in Queensland in Australia, also where I'm based. I'm, I'm based in Brisbane, another part of Queensland. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Uh, thanks very much, Jono, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, have a chat with you this afternoon. 
yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. I don't know if it's coming through at all in the background, but here in Brisbane, uh, where, you know, we talk about Queensland being beautiful one day, perfect the next, we've got, um, uh, I think they're expecting about 80 mils of rain today. So I don't know if that's coming through in the background. It's pretty noisy. Um, uh, we've, uh, we've had a little bit of drizzle, but um, highly unusual weather. We had people come and stay with us last weekend, and I promised that early May was always perfect up here. Yeah. Uh, but, but it didn't quite pan out. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah, it is such a beautiful part of the world, but it's um it's funny how often I feel like I'm on the podcast. I'm like, oh, it's actually raining outside, but I swear it's not that often. Usually, it is it is pretty perfect here in Queensland. Um, so first of all, Steve, tell us a bit about uh, the Bundaberg Regional Council and your role as CEO. What do you do? Sure. Um, look, Bundaberg Council came about uh, as a result of the Queensland government amalgamations back in 2008. So it um, combined three rural councils and the old Bundaberg City Council into one, which made it one of the 12 biggest councils in Queensland. Um, we've got a population in the council area of around about 100,000. So probably, probably 60 of those are in the uh, in the city and then the, the balance is spread along the, the coast and the, uh, and the other rural townships. We're quite a unique council, I think, Jono, in that we we provide pretty much all the services for our community. There's very little that's been contracted out. We still have our own domestic waste collection, for instance, we're the water and sewage provider, and we're heavily involved in a lot of community service type work as well. Um, for instance, we've got some aged care units, which is unusual for councils. So we um, we tend to be sort of all things for all people, which has its, has its challenges, but it also means that um, as a, as an employer, we're probably the largest employer in the region as well. So our budget's around, our recurrent budget's around about 160 million. And normally in a, in a normal year, we'll do about $100 million worth of capital work as well. So it's it's a pretty big enterprise. I've been um, fortunate enough to be here now for five years. I did have some previous association with the area as one of the CEOs of the old rural councils, but uh, I left in 2008 and um, got this job back in the region in 2017. So just ticked over five years. Um, it's, it's a terrific position. As I said, it does come with its challenges, but I've got a, I've got a pretty solid elected council behind me. And um, at the moment, all, all our indicators are, is that we're doing, um, we're doing pretty well. Yeah, it's, um, I think, I think what you do is, uh, to be honest, as someone who works with leaders in all different sectors and you know, all around the world, I find what, what you do in a, in a council really fascinating because it is, you mentioned a few of the things there, just the variety of the services that you offer, um, the, the sheer size of the budget. I think they're amazing. Um, uh, just organizationally, I find them really fascinating and I think it's an incredibly important role. And um, I do have, I mentioned jokingly in the podcast multiple times, Steve, that um, I'm on a secret um, endeavor to get sponsored by Tourism Queensland. Um, wow. So <laughs> because I'm always trying, so I do want to say to our listeners outside of Australia, if you are considering, because we are right now in, what are we, May 2022, if people are in a post-COVID uh pretty post-COVID world considering traveling. Bundaberg is such a, uh, I, I remember my wife and I stayed up in Bagara just out of Bundaberg mm -hmm. for a week. Um, and uh, the Queensland, going up to Queensland and doing the drive up north where you go through Bundaberg and, and spend some time in Bundaberg and Bagara has to be one of the, um, I reckon it's one of the, one of the best places a lot of people don't know about, about Australia. Yeah, look, you're right. I, I live a bit south of Bundaberg, right on the coast in a, in a place called Woodgate Beach. So we, we live sort of almost on the, towards the southern boundary of the, of the council area, which is the Burham River, which separates us from Fraser Coast. But a lot of the other thing I, a lot of people don't realise, John, is we're actually the start of the Barrier Reef. So, uh, you know, Lady Musgrave, Lady Elliot Islands, mm. uh, direct, directly accessed uh, from, from Bundaberg, either by boat or by plane. And, and the... The um, the coral in those on those reefs is apparently um, you know a lot a better than a lot of the the reefs up north and there's no bleaching down this end as well so mm. it is a pretty interesting area and and um, as we talked talked about earlier with normally in a good year with um, <laughs> with reasonable rainfall it's it's very picturesque too we've got 
cane fields, um, a lot of macadamias, um, uh, avocados, and and the biggest sweet potato growing area in the in the country. So a lot of yes. horticultural and agricultural product comes out of this area as well. I didn't know that about the sweet potatoes until last time I was up in Bundaberg and someone mentioned it. And uh, and now I, there you go. So yeah, that was only something I learned recently. Okay, our plug for people to travel to Bundaberg is uh, is now <laughs> partly over. Um, Steve, let's talk about your story as we let's start with your childhood growing up what were some of the moments or even themes from that season of your life that shaped you into the person and the leader you are today yeah look that's a good question um i've been asked that before i, I guess i've had a i had a pretty um i guess a normal childhood by by some standards uh, i grew up in regional new south wales um, most of uh, my childhood was spent in armadale so university town um, my father was actually in local government and for many years I used to joke and laugh that that would be the last place I'd ever, I would ever end up. Uh, and much to his delight, of course, when I finally actually ended up working in a council, uh, he never let me quite forget that. Um, but look, pretty good childhood. We had um, had an older, sorry, younger, rather your younger sister. Um, both my parents worked. Um, I, I guess one other thing that influenced me as a as a child, which has probably flowed through, is my mother went back to uh, TAFE to get the equivalent of a high school certificate and then went to teacher's college as an adult. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting these days, but in the late 60s, early 70s, that was quite unique. So um, I guess that, that learning that my mother had and that quest for higher education uh, certainly stayed with me. One of the, her sayings was, Stephen, you can never be too well educated. And I think I've, I've taken that on board um, over the years. But probably the most interesting part of my leadership journey and where it began, Jono, was that at Armadale High School, where I did all my high schooling, um, I was elected the school captain. Um, and I have to say, I didn't ever see that coming. It wasn't a position I ever aspired to. But when I was elected the school captain by my peers, and I was only 16 and a half, I, I guess I had that realisation about one one was the responsibility of the role, but the second thing was is that the people that you were at school with every day, uh, and you and you'd been through you know um, school with for that six years, had enough respect and for you, and also viewed you as a leader. And, and I guess that was a bit of a wake up call for me in in terms of if people are viewing me like that, then maybe I've got that potential. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what were some other leadership opportunities? You mentioned being school captain. It's funny you mentioned that you it wasn't something you ever considered. I was sort of the, the opposite. I tried really hard to become school captain, and uh, one of my good mates was such a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic guy and just the ultimate um, just connected with everyone so well that uh that he rightfully so ended up school captain and i was vice captain so i like that um i like that contrast as well i went really hard at it got vice captain you didn't see it coming you got it um well, well i didn't um i didn't even vote for myself in the first round <laughs> you're too humble but, no but in the second in the second round I, I i thought the person i was up against i was pretty confident he was going to vote for himself so so, yeah. Oh, that's such a good story of how you started out. I really love it. What about, um, I guess, were there any other leadership opportunities from there in the next few years or uh, anything else when you were young that comes to mind that really shaped you? Uh, the first chance to cast vision or manage a bunch of people or really own a project? Um, look, no, probably, um, you know, in the sporting arena, I was a pretty average, um, pretty average soccer player, but I got a couple of opportunities to to lead uh, our team as you know as the, as the team captain and that's a that's an interesting I guess learning experience in terms of you know the responsibility you have in uh, on a soccer field for a 90 minute game is um, is probably a bit different to running to running an organization um, but look nothing else probably from my uh, my early childhood um, and from there I went to um, I actually went to university on a teacher scholarship so um, there was sort of a year or two of, uh, I have to say, pretty relaxed lifestyle after I finished high school, John. Yeah, absolutely. And from there, I'm interested to know, um, 
when did you, this is always an interesting question. Do you remember when you really found yourself in the deep end as a leader? Uh, you know, so you were, like you said, you were cruising out of school. Um, when, when did you first end up in a role where you went, oh, wow, okay, uh, there was something about the, the group, the size, the, the challenge, the role that you were in that, you know, that first ceiling that you have to break through where you go, okay, I'm really going to have to work out how to get this bunch of people going in the same direction or how to, you know, really do strategic work. What, what was that sort of experience for you? Yeah, look, that is a good question. Um, I, I had set my career, I guess, aspiration about that. Uh, when I was working in local government, I set my career aspiration as wanting to be a CEO or a general manager, as they're called in New South Wales, of a council before I was 40. And probably that first moment was when I got a permanent role as a general manager at a council called Crookwell in southern New South Wales. I had quite an old elected council, so I'm there, you know, mid-30s, quite a bunch of elderly or certainly older councillors. And I remember talking one day at a council meeting and I suddenly had this realisation that everyone was silent. They're all looking at me. They're all taking on board every word I said. And I had this moment where I thought, bloody hell, these people are actually taking me really seriously. And whatever whatever I'm saying today, you know, they're going to act on. And that was just, a, I guess, a moment where I, I realised that within those positions, you know, there's a certain level of trust people put in you. But there's also, I guess, a a level of power, if you like, in inverted commas, that you've, you've, you've got to exercise it right and make sure that what I was telling those people, you know, was going to stack up was accurate. Yeah. And, and so what were uh, your biggest learnings as you navigated that and, and felt the sort of the weight of the responsibility of, of what you were doing? What were your biggest learnings over the coming months and, uh, and years in that role? Yeah, look, pr- probably, and this is probably still relevant today, When you're in a council, you're trying to balance being the leader of your um, staff and, you know, particularly close to your your executive leadership team. You're balancing that with being the advisor to the mayor and the councillors and trying to manage, you know, what are effectively elected representatives or, you know, politicians, you know, to some degree. And that's a real challenge and it still is a challenge. And it's I had seven years in the state government and that was the real, I guess, point of difference I can draw on is the way in which state government works versus local government in terms of what the CEO's role is. And you don't, you have that, I guess, division of power more at state than you do in local where you, you have to balance, you have to manage up as well as down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so do you remember, I guess, more recently in your career, what have been uh, you know, some recent aha moments for you as a leader, things where, uh, you know, where you've dropped the ball and learnt a lot from it or where you've, you know, had an experience and it's gone better than you thought or you had some great advice from someone. Can you recall any big aha moments in, in the recent or even, you know, further back? Um, yeah, look, I think probably most of my aha, uh, sorry, most of my aha moments probably happened a little earlier. Um Probably when I was I was at Byron Shire for seven years, and Byron, as you know, is quite um, an interesting community. Byron was in the throes then of sort of coming out of being an, a you know a working class town uh, into the sort of the, the the region that it is today. There was a lot of tension in the community, which was then reflected in the elected council between people that were perceived as as green versus pro development. And probably the aha moment for me there was I realised that local government, as it was practised in Byron, was a lot more than roads, rates and rubbish. And probably that stuck with me since that time, that viewing councils as being the three R's, as we're often referred to, is completely, in in my view, missing the mark and missing the point about what we do. And I think one of the things that I got out of that, and I was the acting general manager when I left that council, was understanding about what the real role of council is, particularly in communities where there's there's division um, about the future of that that area and what it looks like. Yeah, so it was obviously 
<clears throat> and, and I mean, you expressed that when you introduced Bundaberg Regional Council, the sheer scope of services you offer is well, you know, be, beyond the, the three R's. Um, and, and that's why I think it's such a, that's why I find it such a fascinating, I, I love chatting with people in your role about, um, about what you do, because I feel like I always learn something new as someone that probably does come in with, um, with, has previously had assumptions about what a local council actually does. Uh, what about mentors along the way? Who have been some of the people for you, Steve, who have had the biggest influence on your leadership journey? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm, it's interesting because I'm going to go back to Byron again. Um, two, I have two general managers at Byron, um, one of whom moved to another council and the other one was sacked, which gave me the opportunity, ironically, to be the, the acting general manager. Um, but both those GMs were fantastic. They gave me opportunities within that organisation. Um, they encouraged me. I went back to, um, at that stage, I'd only done my Bachelor of Business. And during that period of time, I, I went back to further study and ended up doing a master's degree while I was there. So that, that was a great learning experience, not only from, you know, as I mentioned about the, the council environment, but also the fact that um, I had two great bosses in that period of time. And, Probably the other one was when I was in state government um, and state, as I mentioned earlier, is a lot, it's a lot different animal, but I had a great boss there, a guy called Paul Lowe, who uh, is now a partner with KPMG and um, I've kept in contact with Paul and uh, yeah, I had a lot of time for him. He was brought into state government at a relatively young age to take up a general manager position or CEO position. And um, he's all, Paul to me, demonstrated all the, the positive things that, that leaders should, should. And that was not always the case in state government, I can assure you, with some of the people I work there. Are there any stories of Paul that come to mind specifically of uh, how he dealt with a, a crisis or something you learned from him, you know, in, in how he was able to, to deal with, um, you know, uh, anything around HR or with strategy? Any, any, um, any stories pop into your mind from your time working with Paul? Look, probably the fact that I've never seen him lose his cool. Um, and wow. I tended to be, in my earlier days, um, I tended to be pretty impulsive and, you know, I'd, I'd often act before I'd think. And and I, I guess why Paul impressed me so much is, when, is that he would always think things through. He'd never seem to get rattled on, certainly not on the surface. And, um, and he tended to then be able to sort of calm everyone around him down, you know, if, if there was a, a potential crisis brewing or something was, um, you know, could have got out of hand. Yeah, that's, that's, um, I, I think that ability, not only in leadership, but in life, if you can keep your cool and stay calm, I never realized that when I was younger, but as I've, uh, as I've <laughs> learned about leadership, I think you realize what a superpower that is, that calming presence um in any setting i know that's that's one thing for me my my wife liz and i at the moment our, our little boy roman is uh six weeks this friday six weeks oh, so we're wow. just yeah <laughs> we're just at the beginning so and he's our first as well so we're learning uh, but that's something that that really struck me even about parenting i thought you know what i i feel like i've um i learned a lot from a, a counselor a great brisbane counselor a guy named peter janetsky who talked about this idea of the ladder and getting triggered and 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 um, that when we're really triggered, we become irrational. So, you know, nothing really new. I know there's a lot of information out there, but that was such a big revelation for me to go, oh, okay, so I need to work out when I'm triggered. And and when I hear someone say that they, they worked with someone who never lost their cool, I go, that's someone who was able to either uh, almost be untriggerable or to actually stay rational and and to and to not you know climb climb the ladder and 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 become irrational and i i have i feel like i'm in awe of that now because as i've become aware of it i've gone okay i'm i'm quite triggerable like there are things that really um i'm quite i quite quickly can lose that calm and that cool what, what have you learned about how to do that for yourself steve like is there anything that you've been able to to glean or put in practice to to learn to stay calm when yeah. i imagine in government there'd be some really hectic things that happen <laughs> and, and <laughs> that would be infuriating or or even really serious and how do you keep your cool 
Yeah, look, that that's a really good question. Um, and another trick I learned from one of those two GMs that I worked for at Byron was that if we were in environments there where we'd often be being challenged or people would be critical and Max always had a habit of instead of reacting, he would say, why do you, what makes you say that? Or why do you say that? So he'd always, he'd always throw it back rather than react straight away. Whereas I'd be ready for the, you know, for the argument or the fight. And Max would make the person then, you know, have to, I guess, justify why they've just made that comment or, you know, were, were supporting that argument. So that was one trick. Um, the, the other thing I've learned, and this gets back to what you said about the, the triggers. I know now what most of my triggers are. And I also know that that's the worst possible time to respond to an email, to make a phone call, to ring the paper up, the local newspaper, because you've just read something that was complete rubbish. So I've learned to step back and wait until I respond in those situations. And it, and it goes often goes against every grain of my body to, to do that. Um, but, it, but it pays dividends. So you go home and you sleep on it or you wait till the end of the day until you know, you've calmed down. So you never, you should never um, respond when you know that, that uh, you've had that, that, that trigger sort of um, pulled. Yeah, I, I love how you put that. There's a, there's a quote, one of my favorite quotes um, that is attributed to Ambrose uh, Bias. And um, uh, it's, uh, it, the quote goes, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> <laughs> well, another, another one of my favorite sayings is by um, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Yeah. If, if you wait by the river long enough, eventually the bodies of your enemies will float past. <laughs> so, and I know that sounds a little graphic, but 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 the underlying message to me was, <laughs> you, you don't try and um, you don't try and win the battle every time someone uh, annoys you. Mm. Yeah, that's so good, and and it is hard because it's easy to say, but then in the moment, that's the whole point of being triggered. I think this is why it was such a revelation for me. That's when you feel that. That's when you lose that rational. Like the whole point of, of the idea of being triggered is that you're, you become irrational and that's when you don't see the point of staying quiet. So it does yeah. take incredible intentionality and I think preparation and practice to actually go, okay, now is the time when I feel like most, I'm the most passionate in my life to say what I want to say. And yet I'm going to realize now is the worst time to say it and to sleep on it. I, I know I found that really difficult and, and I still do, to be honest. Um, well, that's, that's why I, I was so keen to ask about it because it's, yeah, it certainly hasn't come naturally for me. No. Well, and a lot of the personality traits associated with that are what are ones that also are associated with leaders, you know, people that are yes. um, decisive, people that are, you know, that, that, that are prepared to speak up in public, that are extroverts. So there's a lot of, I guess, it's, it's easy to understand why, people that are leaders often have those traits as well. Yeah, I think you're right. It is. Um, and it's so often like that, isn't it? The very thing, you know, I, I love this. Um, there's a, there's a leader I work with and, and he's fantastic with strengths finder. He's done, um, you know, uh, accreditation in it and, and is, uh, I, I always feel like even though I'll be coaching him, I, I'll often learn things about strengths finder when I'm working with him because he's just really brilliant. And, and he introduced me to this idea of, um, which do, it doesn't come from him, but he was the one who introduced me to it, the balconies and basements of strengths. And um, I love that idea because there's, it's always easy when you talk about passion or charisma or however, however you word it, um, there's the balcony, right? That people are able to uh, really wear their heart on their sleeve. But the basement of that is uh, working out, you know, just that one time where you, where you decide at the wrong moment to say something and it comes out wrong or something wrong comes out um, mm. can, can really do like do such damage. You know, you can spend years as they say, you can spend years building that, uh, building that trust up. And in one moment, in, in you know seconds you can you can really destroy uh you know a, a reputation that took years to build yep very true so i'm interested to jump into leadership express i've got a few questions for you steve are you ready 
Sure. So the first question is, I'm interested to know, what's a book that you've gifted to other people or recommended a lot to other people? Um, yeah, look, we, we actually had a, we started a leadership development program here about 18 months ago in-house. And we were actually asked, each of the executive leadership team was asked to, um, to nominate a book for people doing that course to, to read. And, and I went back to one that I've referred to many times over the year and it was, Yes, it's, it's by a guy called Henry Mintzberg, who was an, um, uh, an American professor. And it actually was dated, I'm going to show my age by saying it was dated 1994, but it was called The Fall and Rise of Strategic Planning. And, and why I enjoyed that book so much and got so much out of it is that he really clearly explains, and you can look it up on, I think, of Harvard Business Review if you're a subscriber and get a, a synopsis of it. But it clearly explains explains the difference between strategic planning and strategic thinking, and um, and talks a lot about you know where strategic planning was, particularly in the states in the 90s or the 80s and 90s when it became a bit of a fad, and it's it's a great book to really understand the difference between planning and thinking. Yeah, that's a great recommendation because I think uh, understanding that difference. And it's, it's just amazing when you ask leaders, okay, think back through the leaders you've worked for, the organizations you've been part of, and you, you get them to say how, you know, how well did they uh, do the strategic planning or how well did you do the strategic planning? And then, mm -hmm. okay, you, there's the actual creation of the strategic planning, but then there's the execution. And it's just, um, I think it just goes to show how challenging it is to, to you know to develop and then execute and 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 stick to a really great strategic plan it's it's a i i find anyway it, it's really hard to do because there's so many things that come up and, and get in the way yeah and i tell people that, that you know strategic plans and corporate plans um are not documents to forecast the future because you're going to shape that however you want um but they're documents to at least, you know, give you some indication of some of the challenges uh, that you'll need to that you need to face, or in our case, you know, some of the the infrastructure you'll need to build or the finance you'll need to find to do that. Um, but we're responding to a changing community all the time, and I mean, you've only got to look at what's happened with COVID, and you know, the, the changing demographic. And um, I'm a great Bernard Salt fan. I'm a bit of a Bernard Salt groupie, actually. It's the only person I've ever had a selfie taken with. Um, <laughs> but, you know, salt, salt's really on the money at the moment with, you know, the, the, the change in communities because of um, COVID, people moving out of the cities. Um, and, and I've digressed a little bit, but the importance of that is to us as a council is responding to what will no doubt be a change community, as well as obviously responding to a, a very high growth, growth rate, mm. um, which is going to, going to have come with its own issues in terms of, you know, infrastructure provision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so next question, great, great insights there. And uh, loved, loved that recommendation. Next question, what is a great piece of advice you've received in life, in leadership? At some point, someone gave you a piece of advice, Steve, and, and it's sort of stuck with you and pops into your mind. Yeah, look, I, I guess I already touched on what my mother told me about um, Steve, and you can never be too well, um, you can be, never be too well educated. Um, I, I think probably, I'll uh, probably harking back to, to, to Byron, I guess, just more, not so much advice, John, but I guess more from observation and trying to pick out the best traits of good leaders that I've had and trying to make sure I don't replicate the, the really bad ones from the ones that haven't been good leaders. Um, and I, I, I thought about this a little bit before the um, before you and I were talking, and and I can't think of one specific example other than I realised that I have been probably for my entire working life uh, an observer, uh, particularly of of my immediate managers, but also of people that have been in charge of those whole organisations. Um, and I'll give you one little example. When I was in the Commonwealth Bank, my first ever job, we had a manager who was a Second World War veteran. And his staff meetings used to be held every two weeks. He'd stand on a step above, you know, five steps above us. He'd always finish with one question. 
has anybody got anything to say for the good of the service? So you can imagine that was never really an opportunity for a two-way conversation. It certainly, it certainly headed off any negativity. And, um, and I, I guess I always use that as an example of how not to have a conversation with my staff about has anyone got anything to say for the good of the service? The question should have been, you know, how can we improve our organisation? What can we do better? But that certainly wasn't being encouraged with that question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think there's a strong argument that you really do learn more, uh, you know, around what not to do when you are I- exposed to anything. And, and often, you know, assuming the best of people, it's it's very rarely is it someone's intention. Uh, but you you at, when you're in the shoes of the person being led, when you're when you're in the shoes of the person in a team, and there's some sort of dysfunction, a lack of vulnerability. Uh, a lack of clear direction or, or clarity around roles. It's so painful. And, um, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but it's that idea that as humans, we, we, uh, we react much more strongly to avoid um, pain than we do to work, you know, to go towards um, some sort of gain. And, and when we experience that pain and it is painful when you, mm. when you, when you feel that, you know, it's what fuels me as well with clarity when people aren't able to fulfill their potential, which is what I hear, you know, in, in that story, just an increment, like just a small amount, but in that story, imagine what that branch, imagine what you would have been able to do and, and others around you. Like look at even just you and what you're doing now, Steve, as a young person, if you, if that could have been brought out of you to actually, um, to, to be part of a two way conversation, to make that better, that's, that's, uh, that's a loss. And, uh, yeah, I just think it's often um, there's no way to sort to sort of sugarcoat it. So many leaders, and, and it's an encouragement to young leaders who are in a difficult scenario where they've got a leader where they they might be pulling their hair out, going, I, "I just this is so hard to be in the team with this person because of X, Y, or Z that they're doing." It's mm-hmm. actually what well, as hard as that is, and sometimes it is the right time to leave, or there's things going on that are serious enough. But it's also worth noting as some sort of encouragement that they're often the places where you learn the most. The most. Yeah, that's true. I wish it was different, but that's my experience (laughs) anyway. (laughs) Or you learn the most from your own mistakes. That's also my experience. That's another another very good way to learn. (laughs) Yeah, I've certainly done that in in spades. And there's nothing like really dropping the ball to to learn a lesson that you will never forget. Um, So, Steve, uh, another question. I'm interested to know, are there any... Are there any questions that you ask? You're in a one-on-one interview with, uh, with, you know, as part of HR, or you're with a team, or you're with a group of stakeholders. Are there any questions that are go-to questions you like to ask people? Um, yeah, look, there is one, John. I, I go to every staff induction, um, so we have staff inductions on a three weekly or four weekly cycle, and one of the questions I ask every person in the room, one-on-one is I ask them why they applied for the role that they're in um, and where they came from uh, in physically and I guess and you know and 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 work-wise uh, before they were here and I found that really interesting in the last five years in that how some of those um, trends have changed and, and it's partly driven by, as we discussed earlier, by COVID. But it gives it gives me some real insights into one, you know, the people that are coming into the organisation, but two, how we're viewed, because these are people, you know, within their first few days, so they they haven't come into the organisation and been influenced by anyone else. They're they're fresh, and and these some of these are trainees, some of them are people, you know, in their fifties that are that are coming into 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 other roles. So we put everyone that's that's joined the organisation in that last period of time all come all come to induction together so it's a real mix and and i found that um fascinating to get the insights into uh as i said as to why people have come here mm. and recently we've been getting a lot of uh information about uh, people moving back to the region <clears throat> that might have had family here or have you know been to school here yeah people looking for uh, jobs where they've got career opportunity which was another interesting thing Mm. And people are looking for uh, safe and secure jobs, you know, in a in a what they view as, you know, with a stable employer. Yeah, that's I, I that's a wonderful question to ask as well because that's that's also great information to then take 
um, to, you know, there's so many leaders out there who, when I ask them what, what one of the biggest problems they're facing is, it's, it's around staffing and it's around finding and keeping great people. And I think what you learn in a region in any sort of um, organization where you're in a regional, uh, where, you know, sort of setting like you are, Steve, I think the, my, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this, but I think one of the gifts of being regional is you, you have to learn. There's something that you, that becomes part of your DNA about how to attract and keep people that's different to a city. It's, it's the, the, some elements of what you do in finding and keeping great people are more challenging. Or like you said, in, in one of the things you're trying to find people who either will move regionally or move back to, to where they've, you know, where they were brought up or, and uh, so I always find chatting with leaders um, who work regionally that there's often some ideas and the ways in which you hire that are really creative. And because there's, there's an element uh, it, you know, I guess that you just have to out of necessity. And, and I always find that really fascinating chatting with leaders. You know, is that, does that ring true for you that there's, I guess, some of the challenges around hiring being regional uh, have forced you to be a bit creative and to think outside the box? Yeah, yeah, they have. And, you know, we've had to look at more flexible work arrangements for some people. So people that want to be based, you know, say on the Sunshine Coast and or in one case, um, a guy who's based in Tweed, so we've been really, flex, I guess, looked at, you know, flexible work arrangements, and not just driven by people working from home, but, you know, to, to get the right people here, um, that's one of the ways in which we've done it. The, I, I guess because of COVID, we're actually finding that our numbers of applicants for these roles are actually, most of our roles, I won't say all of them, but for a lot of our roles at the moment are actually um, larger than they normally would be. But, but it is still really difficult to get some sort of key particularly those sort of technical roles um, filled, um, you know, particularly around planning and some of the engineering type roles. And and that's, I guess that's where that flexible work arrangement comes in. Um, but then also people, I'll give you an example. So if you want to send your kids, if you come up here with kids, and you want to send them to a private school, private school fees in Bundaberg are going to be about a half of what they are in Brisbane. So, you know, you can still get <clears throat> good opportunities mm. um, which you know can depending on what stage your life at you know you yeah. can you can look at you can look at the whole package in terms of not just your job and your your salary but what the town's got to offer for you and your family and for your spouse's you know employment opportunities as well so I, I guess it's trying to promote that 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 whole view of what uh, of what moving here means yeah absolutely and um, yeah I think there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of great benefits that people don't don't realize and as with so many as with really anything where you're trying to connect with people and, and really help them understand their their needs it's about unearthing that true point of difference uh, mm -hmm. unearthing the the and the real like you said the pain points that for for a parent who's tossing up two jobs one might be in Bundaberg one might be in Brisbane and for them that they have decided it's it's core for them that they're going to send their kids to a private school to actually look at, like that could be the difference between going, actually, I'm going to make the move. And um, one of the filters so did I you, love. Um, <clears throat> did you create a quote for Roman to go to Bundaberg Christian College when you're up here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's funny because I work with a lot of schools and it's so, um, I always feel like um, <laughs> even before we, we had Roman, I felt like all of these um all of these schools were sort of, they'd look at me with this sort of look like, because I was their sort of dream customer coming in a few years. And I was always like, Oh man. So I, I've had so many spiels from schools. I feel like I feel, I feel, I always feel guilty because I've worked with all these amazing schools. I'm like, Oh, you know, I, they're going to ask me at some point if the rubber hits the road, are you going to send out uh, your, you know, send you can going to send your little guy here. Um, so no, it's definitely an option. It would require a moving city, so probably, probably yeah, uh, unlikely. <laughs> but uh, a wonderful school. Um, so, I, I guess uh, last question. This has been so much fun, Steve. I've loved uh, hearing your story. Last question: If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say to them? Um, can I make it um, two? Yeah, go for it. Okay. And once again, I hark back to what <clears throat> I say at induction, 
particularly for the young people there that are coming in to say off and do their first job. I asked people to think about not just the job they're in now, but where they aspire to be in five or 10 years time and think about what they can do in the period of time that they're employed by us to help achieve that career aspiration. So whether that's by skills on the job, by training, by mentoring, by you know a TAFE certificate or a university degree, think about what you can now do in the next um, few years to position yourself for where you'd like you'd like to be. And the second piece of advice I'd give them is, and I and I strongly believe this because it's happened to me, is that don't be discouraged every time you apply for a job and you may get an interview that you, if you don't get that position. Use every one of those um, knockbacks as a learning experience for next time. So don't be discouraged. And I know it's easy to say, <laughs> But I was in a period of time, I was for a period of time when I left the Shire after amalgamation up until when I went to Canberra. Um, I applied for a lot of jobs. We were in the middle of the um, GFC and I had to mentally get myself around that, that, I guess that same issue, thinking, no, I might have been knocked back, but what have I learned out of this? What can I do better next time? So. They'd be the two key pieces of, pieces of advice I'd give any um, young person coming into the workforce. Yeah, that's that's such great advice. And um, similarly, you know, I remember there was a there was a point where I really wanted to make a, a move and and change careers. Uh, and I remember I applied for about seventy different jobs, and um, I think it was it was discouraging to to. Uh, particularly to not hear back sometimes, which I think was always, has always really inspired me to do my best to, you know, when, when I'm the one um, helping or doing the the hiring to actually make sure I get back to people just because I've been in those, in those shoes. But um, it was for me, the role that, that was a really great role. I ended up working at an organization called the Urban List, which is led by a, fant- a fantastic uh, Brisbane based entrepreneur, uh, Susanna George, uh, and they're expanding into Asia at the moment, and they curate wow. places that you can eat or um, go and visit for art and and uh, bars. It's a really fantastic um, media online media. But I, I started working with Susanna when there, you know, there were only a handful of staff, and we were trying to monetize the Urban List, and I learned so much from her. But she was, you know, that was one of the seventy or seventy five places I applied, and I just happened to get in and and be. Uh, sort of get a bit lucky and say, I'm, hey, oh, by the way, I'm going to be on such and such a street with another interview. And she said, yeah, okay, come in and, and let's meet. And so mm. I think, um, I think, yeah, I, I would just echo that, that you never know which role if you really want to um, to find that next opportunity. And I just learned so much there that I even use now in my consulting because she's such a great leader and entrepreneur. Um, and uh, yeah. Don't be afraid to knock on doors. I, I also had another person on the podcast talk about, uh, I think it was his mum who who applied for 50 jobs, but this is back, you, you know, in the time when rather than sending a letter, it was really going in physically. And and, and so, so she literally went and applied to 50 jobs before she got her sort of first opportunity and she ended up being very successful. And, and I that story has really stuck with me because that number, you know, my 75 were online. But to do 50 <laughs> where you were really, you know, go, having to actually face up, go in, and um, that just blew my mind. Um, so, yeah, what a wonderful, wonderful note to, to land on as an encouragement for young leaders. Uh, for people who've just loved getting to know your story, Steve, where can people find you online, LinkedIn, Twitter? Also, how can people find out more about Bundaberg? Sure. Uh, well, I do have a LinkedIn profile, and um, I... We'll probably be posting a few things later in the year because, <clears throat> pardon me, I've got an opportunity to um, to speak at a couple of conferences. So I'm probably going to post those uh, on my profile, which is um, something I ordinarily wouldn't do. Um, but I think I've reached a stage in my career where I might have something interesting to, to, to say and people might um, might want to have a look at it. Um, but other than that, I'm not, um, I'm not a great one for social media, primarily because of the fact that and a little bit of this links back to what we discussed earlier that 
Um, the last place that a, that a CEO that can be um, can, can get a bit annoyed with people um, should be um, posting comments is on Facebook. Um, although I am a regular target, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is probably <laughs> the best. And Bundaberg, yeah, we're um, it, if you're coming up here, um, great great place for holiday. Lots of coastal areas, and you know, but a beautiful hinterland as well. So um, and yeah, probably thirty minutes off the national highway. So yeah. Um, and if you see any jobs here and you want to uh, you want to find out a little bit more about them, um, contact me through LinkedIn, and I'm more than happy to have a chat. Absolutely. Wonderful place to relocate. I work with someone who made the move to relocate their life to Bundaberg and uh, is loving it. And so, um, yeah, I, I highly recommend that as well. Great place to visit. Also a great place to move to for anyone listening who's going, hmm, maybe that's a place to, to check out because you're looking to, to make a move. Uh, well, thank you to our listeners. I appreciate you tuning in. Don't forget, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day podcast, two places you can also go to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Steve, for being so generous with your time, uh, for sharing great stories from your life and great leadership wisdom, and uh, and also for just being a joy to, to spend time with. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much, Jono. I've uh, really enjoyed um, talking to you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership, and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org, right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. 
Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.